And amen. Genesis chapter 15 tonight. Genesis chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6 tonight. So seeing as how it's only six verses, we shouldn't be here about an hour, hour and a half. You know, I have shared that thing, that, that statement probably 40, 50 times in my ministry and hadn't got a smile yet. I got a smile then. And we're going to talk tonight about wanting an heir. Wanting an heir. Wanting someone to take the legacy of someone. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 through 6. Would you stand as we read these scriptures together tonight? The Bible says, and after these things, that is after the wars, uh, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. And Abram said, Lord, what wilt thou give me, seeing that I, I go childless? And the steward of my house is uh, this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he, shall, uh, but, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought forth him abroad and said, Look towards the heaven and tell the stars that if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he that is Abram believed in the Lord, and it was counted righteous unto him for righteousness. Let us pray. Father God, once again, we thank you for this time of studying your holy, precious word. And Father, I pray that as we see a great application from this, that it will stir us to the depths of our hearts, to the depths of our souls about you wanting an heir, not just Abram wanting an heir. So Lord God, would you lead God and direct us? We ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. Would you be seated? There are so many little... I love this fellowship. You just never know what's going to happen, do you? <laughs> Y'all just want to wait on him to come back? <laughs> That'd make his day, wouldn't it? That's my buddy. Now we'll continue on. First, what we see here is some, some wonderful things that take place, and, and I love it. I've got it down in four different notes tonight. And first, what we see is that God speaks to Abram. We see there where the Bible says, and after these things, Abram, we know, had done right as we shared this morning in God's word. He took a few men and he went out and he fought this battle against this great king and he defeated him and brought all the spoils back, even to the evil king. He did it all because of, of Lot, if you would, his nephew who was taken captive. And after that took place, the Bible says, and of course we know that, that Abram stood for righteousness, that he was blessed by Melchizedek, the priest of Salem, the high priest of Salem, not just the priest, the high priest. And then he turned around and blessed him back by tithing unto him and giving unto him. And yet after that took place, the Bible says, and after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. What a wonderful thing to hear from God. Have you ever heard from God? Be very careful of your answer here. If you have not heard from God, you're not saved. If you haven't heard from God's Spirit drawing you to Christ and convicting you of sin and righteousness and judgment to come and, and surrendering your life to Christ, you're not saved. Surely every believer should have heard from Christ. Now, we're probably, when you hear that statement, have you ever heard from God? Has God ever spoke to, to you? I've never heard him audibly, but I've heard him just as loud as a loudest bell could ring in my heart and in my mind. When I read God's word, I hear God speaking to me. And believers, we should because that's what God's word does. It speaks to us, does it not? Abram heard God speaking to him in a vision. And, and God said unto him, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. Three things that I note there, uh, first off is, is uh, actually four things, is that first God speaks to Abram and he tells him not to fear. Now here's a man who doesn't have the word of God in print. Here's a man who knows God and, 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 and has a, a reverence of God, we understand that, but he hears God saying, fear not, Abram. Fear not. Well, to me, Abram seemed to be a pretty fearless man. He took 318 men and went up against a nation and defeated them. 
And then he turned around and went before the, the king of Sodom and got in his face, basically, and said, I don't want your spoils. I don't want none of your evil stuff. I want God to love me. I want God's blessing. Fear not. God tells him not to fear. Well, my dear friend, God tells us over and over in the Scriptures not to fear. He says in the New Testament that he does not give us the spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. But how many times do we let fear grip us? Pull us away from faith in God. Make us scared. Now, I know God made us with emotions. And I understand why God didn't give us a switch to cut our emotions on and off. Because if he did, we'd cut them off and leave them off. And then we'd be zombies walking around. And I understand that sometimes that emotional fear can overcome us. But then we need to grip ourselves and stand strong in the Lord and say, I'm going to trust in God. Why? Because of the same things we see where God told Abram. Because God called Abram by name. There was that personal, intimate relationship where he says to Abram, he says, fear not, Abram. He wasn't talking to Lot. He wasn't talking to anybody else. He had a direct communication, a direct direct relationship with Abram. Friends, we have that relationship with Almighty God. You know, in Catholicism, it's almost like you can't hear from God. Only the priest can. The priest tells you what God says. We know that, that as the priest of the believer, we can speak to God and hear from God without a preacher. God called him by name. Not only that, God assured him of his safety. Isn't that a wonderful thing he took away? He says, don't fear because I'm your shield. Don't be afraid, I'm your protector. Don't worry about it, I'll meet all your needs according to my riches and glory. God tells us the same thing. He assures us, he speaks to us, he tells us not to fear Because he'll meet all of our needs. And then he says this wonderful thing. And thy exceedingly great reward. Fear not, Abram, for I am thy shield. And basically I am, uh, will give unto thee thy uh, thy exceedingly great reward. Which means that God assures Abram of happiness. That's the greatest reward we can have apart from salvation, which salvation should bring euphoria in our hearts and our minds. The greatest happiness of all is knowing that we're saved, we're children of the King, going to heaven to be with Him forevermore, no matter what this world hurls at us, no matter how difficult it gets, God speaks to us and He tells us not to fear. He calls me by name. He calls you by name. When God speaks to you, you, does He call you buddy? And I'm not talking about his friend. Or do you hear God calling you by your name? Does he assure you of safety? Absolutely. His word does. Does he assure you of happiness? Yes. It may not be happiness as we would hope it would be just total elation all the time. For now. But there's coming a time when we'll be happy forevermore. There'll never be a sadness, no sorrows, no tears, no sickness, no hurting. God speaks to Abram. Abram just won this great battle. Boy, you know Abram's got to be walking on cloud nine. Then Abram speaks to God. We see that in verse 2 and 3. And Abram said, Lord, God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the, and the servant in my house, this Eleazar of Damascus, and, and Abram said, Behold, to, to me thou hast given me no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Here's God speaking to Abram. And God says to him, he says, Don't fear anything. I'm your personal God. He says, I'm going to assure you of safety. I'm going to assure you of happiness. And what does Abraham say? He said, Blessed be to God. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Glory. He said, God, I don't got no child. Well, that was good grammar, wasn't it? God ain't got no child. <laughs> it's a double negative. God, you haven't blessed me. I go childless. I don't have a child. There's somebody else in my house that's got a child. And if I don't have any children because I'm already a man of extended years, then all of a sudden this this child here in my house, even though it's my servant's child, is going to be the heir to everything. He's going to take over and have everything I own. But it's not mine. 
His desire was, what will thou give me? You say you'll give me you give me strength and I don't have to fear and you'll be my shield and you'll give me exceeding happiness, but I'm not real happy because I don't have a child. That was his complaint. My servant is child is my only hope for an heir. You've God, you haven't kept your promises to me. You ever felt like that? You ever had that elongated time where God has called you to do something or God said, I'll do something in your life and, and a week goes by or a month goes by or a year goes by and God hasn't done what he's, you really heard him say in your heart that he would do and you start questioning God? God, you're not, saying what, you're not doing what you said you'd do. You ever done that? Am I the only sinner in this place tonight? I fight that every night of my life in my bed, folks. God called me to build a ministry to help hurting pastors six years ago. And I have the vision. I know in my heart what he wants us to do. And I believe with all my heart he's going to do it. I just don't know when he's going to do it. And I have heard him speak just as loud as thunder in my heart soon. That's six years ago. Six years and when those thoughts do come in my heart and my mind, and they do come regularly, I try to bring them into check, say, okay, God, that's me. That's buddy being buddy. I know what you said. I know what your will is, and I'm going to believe that to the day I die. But don't think it, don't come, it doesn't come sometimes where I have just like Abram, Lord, you ain't kept your promise. But you cannot continue on that train of thought. You have to stop it in faith. Because that is not a faith thought. You see, God had told him in Genesis 12 too, he says that God will make him a great nation. In Genesis 13 and 6, he says to Abram, your seed will be as the dust of the earth. And Abram's still complaining, my servant's child will rule over my labor. That's pretty bad, isn't it? You work hard for something all your life, and you have no heirs to carry it out, and some other G-hopper is going to come in and take your stuff and play with it. To ask a question does not mean that you do not believe. God made us with emotions. He made us with feelings. Satan knows how to trigger those feelings. And, some, and it is a lack of faith. But friends, let me tell you that when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. When sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. When those thoughts enter our mind, and they do for all of us, when we start dwelling upon them and thinking about them, that's when it brings forth that separation between God. But if we call it into check immediately... If we stop that and say, I'm not going to, to believe that. I'm going to trust my God. Not my circumstances, not my situation, not the longevity of it, because I believe in him. So just because those questions arise doesn't mean that you don't believe. It's just the human makeup. It's how we're put together. But isn't it wonderful that even though God speaks to, like Abram, and then God, Abram speaks to God, and he has this complaint, that God turns right around in the next two, next two verses and reassures him. Look what God says to Abram in verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. That's how I know that God spoke to him. God, again, God reassured him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought forth, uh, excuse me, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look, towards the, uh, look now towards the heavens and tell the stars if you be able to, count, to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Abram, God has just blessed Abram, won a great victory. He says, you don't have to fear anything. I'm your personal God. I'm your shield. And I'm going to reward you exceedingly greatly. And Abram says, well, that all sounds good, but I don't even have a youngin. And it's all about that male heir. I don't have a, a male to, to carry on my name. My servant does, and I don't want all my stuff to go to him, God, and just keeps complaining, asking the questions. And God reassures Abram, and what he does, he confirms that Abram will have his own child. 
Remember, Abram and Sarah were old of age when they had their first child. We'll see that in our studies in the days to come. Pretty, pretty old. And here's Abram hearing God right now, and the word said unto him, but God does even more than that. He not only assures him and confirms that he'll have an heir, he says that your heir will not be somebody else's heir. Let's just go ahead and get that out of the way. He says to Abram, he says, Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he says, This shall not be your heir. In other words, God didn't say to Abram, I'm going to give you an heir, and let Abram still go around and question, Well, is this going to be my heir? He said, That one is not going to be your heir. And then God affirms once again, he says, But you shall have an heir that shall come forth out of your own bowels. Well, that pretty much settles the issue that Abram and Sarah will have a child. Isn't it wonderful when God brings out assurance? In my ministry of helping hurting pastors, uh, not well, it's actually the, f- the first of the month, I have a little church in Glenville that supports our ministry, $100 a month. Been doing it for two and a half years. Uh, little church probably takes in maybe $500 a week, pays a, sa- a salary for a pastor, and once a month they send me $100. And it never ceases to amaze me that that uh, when these thoughts hit my mind, God, you've called me to this ministry and nothing's happening here and everything's going out and nothing's coming in. And all of a sudden I go to the mailbox and there's a check for 100 bucks from a little country church affirming, reassuring God's will. Nothing else, exactly what God said. It had come through me. His seed shall be as the stars in the sky. I love how, how, the, how the King James says this, that, that um, he says, Thine heir shall, uh, excuse me, but the word of the Lord came unto, unto Abram, and he said, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he that is God brought him, that is Abram, forth abroad and said, Look towards now and towards the heaven, and tell the stars if you be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. God said, Let me show you something, bud. And he took Abram outside. He said, Look up in the sky. He said, I'm not telling you, I'm demonstrating to you that if you can count the stars in the sky, you will understand how great you're going to be and it's going to come from your own bowels. It's going to come from your own heart. It's going to be your lineage, your heir. I don't know about you, but that's pretty good assurance, isn't it? That wasn't, you may have some kids. That wasn't, you'll have an an heir, but I don't know how, how far it's going to go. You see, God had already promised him earlier that your, your children, you shall have his children as the dust of the earth, and I'm going to make you a great nation, which means plurality of individuals, of people. And now he says, that may be great, but I'm going to show you something even larger than that. Look at the stars. You can't number them. When's the last time you went out in the dead of night and looked at the stars? It's a little bit difficult in the city because of all the lights. I live in the country. I live where it gets what we call dark 30. You ever been there? That's like when you're walking, all of a sudden you go, oh, what was that? (laughs) It was a tree. Well, how how come I didn't know it? It doesn't have a light on it. It's dark. And then you get that privilege on a beautiful starlit night to look up. See the hand of God. And think about God told Abram. And look what happened. Today there's still the children of Abraham still going and going and going. So we see God speak to Abram and we see Abram speak to God. And we see God reassure Abram. And then look at Abram's assurance in verse 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it, the God counted it to him for righteousness. Friend, God says he's going to do something. He's going to do it. We better believe it. We ought to believe it. We must believe it. And God counted it to Abraham, to Abram, for righteousness. Listen to God's word in in Romans chapter 4, verse 19 through 20. The Bible says, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about 100 years old, neither uh, yet in the deadness of Sarah's womb. This is speaking of Abram. 
And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He staggered not, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, that what God had promised, God was able to also perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Abram said, God, you said it. I believe it. And God did it. In that same passage or same chapter of Romans, going back to verse 1 of chapter 4, the Bible says, What shall you we then say that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abram uh, were justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God. For what hath, uh, had, excuse me, for what saith the scripture? Abram, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Not because he had all the children, but because he believed that God said he'd have all the children. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Friends, believing counts for something. I cannot tell you all the naysayers that I've dealt with in my life, and especially in the ministry, when you tell them you know this is of God, and they say it's not, and if it doesn't come to fruition as we think it should be, that doesn't mean that God didn't call us to do what he called us to do. He just called us to be faithful in obedience. It's the journey that we're on. It may not be the outcome that it's all about God's will as much as it is the journey for our lives. In the same book of Romans, I think about Abram and I think about what God told him. And the Bible says, And he believed in the Lord and God counted to him for righteousness. Abram wanted an heir so bad he could taste it. I know a young couple in our church It's about to have a baby. And there was a time in their life where they didn't know if they could or not. Wanted one pretty bad, though, didn't you? I offered you mine. They're in their 20s, already potty trained. <laughs> I've dealt with a lot of young couples who've Wanted children and couldn't have children. It's not easy. It hurts. I've had women sit in my office and young ladies and just weep and cry. Felt like they were unworthy of God to bless them with a child. Felt like they were not complete because they couldn't have children. That's a lie from hell, folks. That's Satan's way of trying to grind somebody down. Look at Abraham and Sarah. They, go, they was up in their hundreds before they had any children. Can you imagine how many people laughed at them? Here you are. You're supposed to be the father of our nation. You can't even have a child. But I think we read tonight that Abraham wanted an heir. He said, Lord, I don't want my servant's heir. I want my own heir. And God said, you'll have it in greater ways than you ever could have thought. And when I think about that, I think, well, how do you make all this come together? How, what's the application to this? Well, I'm a little thick sometime in my head, but God can get through it. The application is simply this. God wants heirs. His heir is Jesus Christ. We understand that. But God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. But according to God's word, he is long-suffering towards us, not that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God wants every human being, man, woman, boy, and girl, to be saved, to become an heir to the throne of the living God. God wants heirs, even more so than Abram. Listen to God's word as we go back to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 17, God's word says this, For as many that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we call, we cry, Abba, Father. And the spirit itself bears witness to our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, and the heirs of God, then join heirs with Christ. The son of the living God, you and I who are believers, we are joint heirs with him. You know what that means? That means that all that God has, all that God's made, belongs to us. It's ours. We're going to inherit it one day. Many inherit it now when they leave this physical body and their, body, their spirit goes to be with the Lord. They're getting their inheritance now. And we long for that in that day called the rapture when God's son will come back and take this church out of this sinful dying world and take it to heaven's glory. That's our promise from God. In the book of Galatians, let me read to you out of chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. The Bible says this, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, an heir of God through Christ. Friends, Abram cried out, I want a son, I want a child, I want an heir. Friends, God's word is saying he wants that. In the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 5, the scripture says, Hearken, beloved brothers, brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Whew. Well, if that don't get you going, I don't know. Listen, hearken, my beloved brethren, James says, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, that's who we are, who are now rich in faith and now heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. You fall in love with God through his son, Jesus Christ. You get all that God has. It's our inheritance. Now, friends, we're not justified by our works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For, for by faith you are saved through grace and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't buy this inheritance. It's God's gift to us. And God wants heirs. And he's not talking just about those of us who are in the church now. He's talking about all of humanity who he wants to be the church. And if that is the case, my dear friends, we ought to be striving to lead people to Jesus Christ. Well, some don't want to give up their inheritance. I don't want nobody else getting what I got. Kind of sound like Abram, didn't it? I don't want my servant's son to get what I got. I want that to go to mine. Well, I just got the funny feeling in my heart, in my mind, that God's inheritance will never run out. It's called eternal. You'll never exhaust it. And Brother Gene could get all he could get from now forever and ever and ever and evermore. And I could go get all that I could get from now forever and ever and evermore. And we still will never come close to exhausting what God has for us. But don't you try to get mine. Because you can't. Because you can only get it for you and I can only have it for me. God wants an heir. And he wants every heir he can get. That's why he sent his son to die for us. I understand what it's like wanting a child. The Bible says, as arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, speaking of an example of children, it says, happy is the man that has his quiver full. Because you can send them out in different directions where you're not to present the gospel of Christ. Not everyone has children. Sometimes you have to have children in different ways. My oldest daughter 
was one year old when my dad passed away. She was one and a half when my wife's dad passed away. So basically, my three children never knew their grandparents. Some of you may have come through that. Your parents may have died. Your grandparents may have died. But I guarantee if you look back in your life, you'll see many people who stepped in a place to be a grandparent to you or a parent to you and love you. Somewhere down the line, God wants an heir. He wants everyone to be saved. We need to tell them about Jesus. Let's pray.